Hi, welcome back to the channel. Throughout time, physicists and philosophers have proposed various interpretations to answer the question, what does quantum mechanics mean for the nature of reality? In today's video, I want to explore six different such interpretations, how they developed and what they imply about reality. We will go about this in three different ways. First, we will look at the timeline, so who came up with the interpretations and when. Then I will give you a comic book style presentation of the workings of each interpretation. And to make this a bit more tangible and relevant for real life, we will look at the Israel-Iran conflict and see what each interpretation would say about what determines the outcome of an event like that. This video will be longer than usual, so please refer to the timestamps in the description box below if you want to jump ahead to a particular section. This short introduction regarding the origins of the interpretations, I am going to attempt to convey the core ideas of each interpretation by way of a simple comic strip. But let's quickly look at the basics for those of you new to the topic. Quantum mechanics is the branch of physics that studies the smallest particles in the universe, atoms and subatomic particles. These particles behave in strange and unexpected ways that challenge our everyday understanding of classical physics. Unlike larger objects which follow predictable paths, particles at the quantum level seem to be particles and waves at the same time. They appear to exist in multiple places or states simultaneously, and they don't settle into one clear state until an observer measures them. Or do they? That's the question. So this weirdness leads to three big questions, really, which physicists have grappled with for a long time, and which is why there are so many interpretations of the phenomenon. The three big questions are, what does quantum mechanics tell us about the nature of reality? What exactly causes a specific outcome to happen over another when we measure a quantum system? Does the observer influence what happens? Or is measurement simply a way to passively learn about something that is already out there? Each interpretation of quantum mechanics provides its own answers to these questions. As we compare these interpretations, we will see that each one has a unique take on the core idea of quantum reality, what determines outcomes and how the observer is involved. Now, since there is always talk about the wave function, let's look at the definition so that we understand what we're talking about. What is a wave function? A wave function in quantum mechanics is a mathematical function, a formula that provides a description of the quantum system. Represented typically by the Greek letter psi, the wave function is a complex valued function of the particle's coordinates and time containing all the information about the system's physical properties. What can a wave function look like? I'm just going to show you one example. So do you have a general idea of what this would look like if we were to visualize it? Now let's go to the comic strips. Right, so to simplify matters, we will have four icons um, to represent the concepts that we're using. Um, we will depict the wave function as a simple bell curve. 
we will use an eye to signify the observer. We have a magnifying glass signifying the act of measurement. And we will use the lightning symbol to signify the outcome of such a measurement. And we will start with the Copenhagen interpretation. In the Copenhagen interpretation, the wave function represents the superposition of all possible outcomes. It's sort of a placeholder for all the possible states of a quantum system until a measurement is made. And when the measurement is made, um, the wave function collapses to a specific result represented here by the lightning. So the act of the measurement in the middle collapses um, the wave function and therefore collapses the superposition of all possible outcomes into a single observable reality over here. The role of the observer is a passive one in the Copenhagen interpretation. Um, once the measurement happens, here in the middle, um, the observer just observes the outcome. So the outcome itself is not influenced by the beliefs or knowledge of the observer before the measurement occurs. And if we had to summarize this um, Copenhagen interpretation in a catchphrase, we could simply say reality waits for a measurement. Okay, now let's go to the many worlds interpretation. In the many worlds representation uh, interpretation, we start out the same way as in the Copenhagen interpretation. So there's a wave function representing all the possible outcomes. And when we measure the system, uh, there's a big difference. In the many world interpretation, every possible outcome of a quantum measurement happens, but in different parallel universes or branches of reality. So there is no wave function collapse, but each possible outcome corresponds to a different world. So all possible outcomes happen. Whenever a quantum event occurs, um, in, in effect, the entire universe splits into different branches. Um, this includes not only the particles that we observe uh, in the event, but also everything that interacts with them, including you yourself as the observer. So observers do not influence the outcome. Um, rather, each version of you, so to speak, <laughs> Um, one in each newly created branch of reality over here um, experiences only one specific outcome with no awareness of all the other branches of reality. So there isn't a choice or assignment of a singular you to one branch, but every possible version of you, so to speak, exists across all these branches. And if, again, we would have to... Um, put that in a catchphrase, we, we could say everything that can happen does happen. Thirdly, we have the uh, objective collapse theories or GRE theory for as an example. Um, in the objective collapse interpretation, we also start out with a wave function. Um, the wave function collapses objectively and spontaneously at some point in the Independent of the observer, um, and this collapse leads to a single definite outcome. Unlike uh, in the Copenhagen interpretation, this collapse of the wave function does not require an active measurement, which is why we are uh, missing the um, the uh, magnifying glass symbol here in the middle. Um, it just the, the wave function just sort of happens naturally over time. And again, observers um, simply witness the outcome after the collapse has occurred. Um, their expectations and beliefs play no further role in determining the outcome. The outcome is merely a result of purely objective processes. And our catchphrase here would be 
Nature decides with or without us. Fourth, we have cubism or quantum base basinism. In uh, cubism, the wave function is not an objective description of reality, as in the other cases we just discussed. But it's more like a tool that each individual observer uses to manage their personal expectations. So it is subjective, uh, representing an observer's belief about a possible outcome. You could almost say that it's almost like the wave function here is almost like a pair of glasses that the observer wears. Well, you know, you, the proverbial rose-colored glasses when he looks out into the world. And <clears throat> a measurement similarly is viewed as an interaction between the observer and the quantum system that is being measured. So the outcome of a measurement is a unique experience for that particular observer. The outcome does not reveal an objective property of the quantum system itself, but it is an experiential result of the interaction between the observer and the quantum system. So in cubism, essentially, the wave function and the outcome of a measurement are personal to each observer. I was trying to um, sketch that here by showing two observers, um, each having their own sort of version of the observation of the quantum system. So if you have two observers, you essentially have two individual experiences. Um, but as each wave function reflects an individual's subjective beliefs about the probabilities of, you know, the various possible outcomes and not an objective universal reality, um, the probabilities of various outcomes um, and not an objective, uh, the result each observer gets is a unique experience that applies only to them. So this means that um, each observer constructs their own understanding of reality based on their interactions with the world. Um, although cubism emphasizes subjective experience, it doesn't imply that observers exist in isolated or incompatible realities. Um, rather, observers often, I mean, they can share similar experiences and they also can communicate their results, which allows for consensus about um, certain regularities in nature. I mean, to take a really um, simple example, <laughs> if you have two people look looking at the traffic light, um, although they both have their own interpretations of the traffic light turning green, so to speak, they're both observe that the light turning green which is why they can um, agree on you know the status of the traffic light being green so it's the, obviously it's a bit of a clumsy example because the traffic light is not a quantum but a classical system but nevertheless um, right so and if we had to catch this cubism in a catchphrase we could say each to their own now in relational quantum mechanics um, this is a little bit of a tricky one you can already see by the by the drawing <laughs> so as in cubism quantum states do not represent objective properties of a system but instead each quantum state is defined only in relation to a specific observer um, or <coughs> excuse me or measuring system so we need to stress the term relation here, which is signified by the dotted lines um, going from the wave function to the eye. An outcome is determined by that specific interaction between the observer and the quantum system. Um, this interaction brings the quantum state into relation with the observer and it is through this relationship <coughs> excuse me, that an outcome appears. So the result of a measurement only exists in relation to the observer performing it. Um, the observer's interaction with the system creates a specific result, which is meaningful within that 
particular relationship signified by those dotted lines again. But the result doesn't have to agree with or be meaningful to another observer, which is why we have another second observer here with a question mark. And <coughs> we could summarize this by saying it's all relative, even reality itself. Lastly, in quantum idealism, consciousness, and here's the big difference, is the fundamental reality with physical phenomena emerging from it. So reality exists because it is perceived and shaped by consciousness. The outcome of a quantum event in quantum idealism is determined by the collective intentions and focus of consciousness. So consciousness sees, um, here signified by the multiple eyes, um, collapse the possibilities into one specific shared experience. Um, so observers in quantum idealism are not merely passive spectators, but they are co-creators of reality, really. They co-create with their consciousness. And each observer's beliefs, emotions and intentions contribute to the collapsing of potential outcomes into observed reality. Um, in terms of catchphrase, we could say consciousness creates the cosmos. Before we dig into this, I need to clear up one thing, and that is the so-called micro-macro inequality. Non-quantum or classical systems are described in terms of high probability and low variance outcomes. In classical mechanics, the types of interactions we typically observe are large, deterministic or highly predictable. Since classical systems exhibit much less uncertainty or in indeterminacy, observers will have very similar, if not identical, expectations about the behavior of such systems. So technically, it is wrong trying to apply quantum laws to classical macro systems like the Israel-Iran conflict. But by applying the core ideas of the various quantum interpretations to a non-quantum or classical situation like that can illustrate how these interpretations differ in their treatment of reality, observation and uncertainty, which is why I'm doing that here. It's for illustration purposes only. So let's, for example, take the Israel-Iran conflict, a non-quantum system, and consider what each interpretation of quantum mechanics would say about the probable outcome of the conflict. Under the Copenhagen interpretation, the conflict can be viewed as being in a superposition of possible outcomes, which can be diplomacy, military action, etc., until a decisive measurement or event occurs, such as Israel or Iran taking action. The exact outcome is not determined until an action or decision is made, at which point the potential outcomes collapse to a single one and observers then passively witness the result. In the many worlds interpretation, every possible reaction to the Iran-Israel conflict happens, but in parallel realities. For instance, in one universe, Israel responds with military action. In another universe, diplomacy prevails. In yet another, a different unforeseen outcome unfolds. All these branches are equally real, but a in separate worlds. Under the objective collapse interpretation, a definite outcome such as military action or a diplomatic resolution will occur at some point determined by an objective collapse process inherent in the system itself, so without the need for external observation. The event is predetermined by physical processes and observers witness the outcome after the fact. In cubism, each observer, for instance, each government analyst or individual, holds their own subjective beliefs about what Israel's response will be or Iran's response will be based on their prior knowledge and information. 
There is no objective universal quantum state that describes the conflict. Um, observers' expectations are subjective. And while they help the observers manage uncertainty, their beliefs don't determine the actual outcome. In relational quantum mechanics, each observer has a different perspective on the conflict, shaped by their specific relationship to the events. For example, Israel, Iran and third party countries all interact with the conflict in different ways, so their observations or understanding of the conflict are different, but valid from their own perspectives. There is no single objective reality, but a collection of relational perspectives. In quantum idealism, the conflict's potential outcomes, for example, peace or escalation, are shaped by the collective consciousnesses of all observers involved, of all the observers really who play an active role in collapsing possible outcomes. So based on their shared intentions, beliefs and foci. In this view, the conflict doesn't exist independently of consciousness, rather it is co-created by the collective consciousness of all involved. Observers are active co-creators whose intentions contribute to manifesting specific outcomes. Reality itself is a product of consciousness. Among physicists, the Copenhagen interpretation is considered the orthodoxy and remains widely taught and used due to its historical significance and ease of application in quantum experiments. However, many worlds or the many worlds interpretation has gained traction, especially in theoretical physics and in cosmology for its elegance in avoiding collapse and its appeal in multiverse theories. Objective collapse theories have a dedicated following, particularly among those exploring the philosophical and physical nature of quantum measurement. Cubism and relational quantum mechanics offer philosophical depth, gaining interest in quantum foundations and philosophy, but are less applied in experimental contexts. And in academic physics, quantum idealism is largely viewed as speculative or far out. Uh, it's far less influential than the other interpretations. Now, I hope I was able to show that exploring quantum mechanics is not only about equations and theories, but also about grappling with the very nature of reality and our role within it. Each interpretation of quantum mechanics from the Copenhagen view to quantum idealism offers us a distinct lens through which to understand our universe and the complexities of observation and consciousness. If today's video resonated with you, particularly if you want to dive deeper into quantum idealism, um, I invite you to read a book that I wrote myself in 2023 called The End of the Eye. In the book I challenge traditional materialist view and I propose a fresh perspective on human consciousness and the limits of the ego. I propose a vision for human existence that moves beyond the idea of an ego or self and I open up possibilities for a new understanding of our place in the cosmos. The link to all my books are in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye bye.